Hello, uh, my name is Rosa Cheng, a special project assistant at the Maryland State Art Council. Welcome to this session. I'm here today to host this session called Farming as an Art, Commun Art and Community Engagement Practice. Laura Connelly, son English junior, Kenya Miles, and I have been working since January 2019 on pilot project called the Natural Dye Initiative. Today, we will tell you about what we've been doing for last 18 months. Also in this session, Laura, Sun, and Kenya will share their own experiences working with the plants, natural dyes, and the lo local community as organizers, farmers, and how these experiences leverage their own art practice and creativity in Baltimore City. We have many beautiful plants and gardening photos coming up in this session. I'm hoping that all nature photos provide you peaceful and therapeutic moments on this Friday. I have a quick announcement before we start. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their energy to making this history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some are drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generation than can be counted. We acknowledge we are standing on ancestral land and we honor the thousands of enslaved Africans who live were physically and spiritually stolen. We pay respect to their elders past and present. To navigate to other sessions occurring during this time block, please click in the upper left hand corner where it says schedule session one of and a drop down menu will show all of the session available at this time. Feel free to interact with the presenters and each other in the chat located on their right hand side of the screen. If you have a question you would like to have answered, please use the ask a question module at the bottom of the screen. Thank you for attending the virtual Maryland Art Summit. Now I will turn it over to Laura Connelly, a program manager at Parks and People Foundation. Laura, ready? Yep. Can All right. You? Okay. Hi. Um, do I show up on the screen or no? I'm sorry? Do I show up on the screen or no? Let me see. Okay. Um, well, I'm, hi, I'm Laura Connolly. Um, I have been with the Parks and People Foundation, which is a nonprofit in Baltimore City um, for going on six years now. Um, and I have a background in biology. I worked at the Department of Natural Resources before that, so I don't really have a professional arts background, although I do have a personal interest, um, especially in fiber arts and knitting. Um, so Parks and People is a, a nonprofit founded um, in 1984, and we have, um, as our name suggests, we do uh, park projects. We create and renovate parks in Baltimore City and um, we also run youth programs um, for the people side. We, we serve um, youth in Baltimore City, uh, high school students, middle school sports, and um, elementary school students as well through our Super Kids Camp. Next slide. Um, so this project for us, the, the Baltimore, Baltimore Natural Dye Initiative, um, is a little bit of a special project for us. Usually we're doing Park projects or youth programs, um, and we do have a strong partnership with the uh, many state agencies, one of which being um, the Department of Housing and Community Development, um, who brought this project to us uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, we had been doing some vacant land park projects um, in partnership with the state and city. Um, and this, this project came to um, the attention of state agencies through um, the First Lady of Maryland's um, uh, interest in um, after visiting um, Naju, South Korea. 
uh, and seeing the, the natural dye center there. Um, and then she kind of uh, brought about an interest in creating a multi-agency, multi-sector um, pilot project in Baltimore City. And where it layers with us is um, originally the, the idea was to do it with uh, by farming um, a vacant property in West Baltimore. Um, and the project had already been um, going with a bunch of these partners you see on your screen. Um, and Micah has a whole natural dye curriculum that they had been doing for a while and doing a lot of the um, cultural and, search, uh, and uh, social research behind natural dye as well. Um, and so we became involved kind of as the facilitator for the actual on the ground project. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the logistics of um, actually doing the work and then um, Sun and Kenya, our farmers, can tell you a little bit more about um, some of the more, you know, uh, technical art and farming aspects of it. So um, originally the site in West Baltimore was where the old Lutheran hospital stood and um, the Marbidco, which is the nonprofit um, ag development um, corporation in Maryland, put out an RFP for farmers um, and that site was, just wasn't gonna work. There wasn't much interest because um, there weren't many um, amenities on the site. And so um, Parks and People, we have a nine acre campus um, right across from the Mondaman Metro Station. Um, we have, we had lots of land and we had just completed our master plan. Next slide, Rosa. Next slide. Um, and we had room and um, the ability to house this project. So we took it on for its two pilot seasons. We're in the second um, season right now. Um, so we worked with the, the landscape architect firm that did our master plan, which is on the left, to kind of convert it into this temporary special project um, and host it on our site where we have, um, you can see in the, the little map, um, on the right, the Silver Center, which is a modular building that was donated by the Green Building Council um, to house all the, the farming work um, and then to farm the actual land on our site and use our existing um, historic carriage house um, to dry and process some of the plants. Um, next slide. So as we are, we're kind of developing this program from scratch, so it was, you know, you don't really know how to form kind of like a a cloud of an idea into something concrete and put it um, put next steps and um, and deadlines and really figure out how to make it work. So that's uh, what Parks and People's role has been mostly. Um, I'm the Park Finance and Administration um, Manager at Parks and People, so um, I do a lot of grant management and budget kind of stuff. So I kind of shaped the state resources that were available for this project into um, to a project that was, um, you know, based in something that's not typically something that we do. So we, um, you can see, we transformed um, some space on our property uh, to be the beds for the different dye plants. Um, next slide. And, um, through Rosa. Rosa had been doing work for years and years on um, indigo and developing the schedule and the actual, the plan for planting and um, all the stuff that was really necessary to, to get, like hit the ground running and get this project moving very, very quickly. Um, Parks and People was brought this project in, I think, November uh, of 2018. Um, and we had to get it all set for the season in 2019. So without all the legwork that Rosa and the rest of the partners had done, it wouldn't have happened. It barely happened. Um, and luckily we were able to find um, Kenya and Sun, who you see pictured, um, to hire them. Um, many, you know, many other um, farmers by that late in the season, there is, um, you know, they already have their plans for the following year. So we were extremely lucky to find um, Kenya and Sun and, and be able to hire them. Um, and bring all their knowledge and um, background to this project. Next slide. 
And so uh, Rosa had developed um, with the partners the, the dye plants that would actually go into the ground for the pilot season the first year. Um, so for this year, it's kind of cut off, I think, but we did um, two species of indigo, tropical indigo and um, Asian indigo. Uh, um, and then marigolds, three species of marigolds and black eyed Susans, um, which are native here, obviously. And then woad, um, which is European indigo. And we put that in um, an existing um, USDA garden that our branch of students, our high school program, um, had already started a couple of years ago because it's kind of an invasive plant. So we kept that sequestered. Um, next one. Um, and so then we quickly threw together um, a seed starting setup. Luckily, our um, the, edu the environmental education team on our staff um, already had an equipment list for starting seeds for the USDA garden. And um, so they they kindly gave us their equipment list and we ordered everything really quick and we got, you know, contracts put together for the farmers and we got them signed. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, a lot of things fell into place um, to get us running uh, up and running very quickly. Next slide. Um, so this is what we look look like um, peak uh, growing season. Um, you can see the marigolds and um, the top middle photo is the, the Asian indigo. Um, the top right photo is um, a, um, a community planting day we did for the Black Eyed Susans. We planted over 500 of them, I think. Um, and we had partners from the state and from MICA and we invited the community um, to come plant um, these dye plants. And then um, on the bottom right is them in full um, bloom, the Black Eyed Susans. Next photo. Um, and since we have, um, we run youth programs on our site, we, uh, when we found out about this project, we definitely wanted to integrate that into our youth programs. Um, so you can see over the summer, we have um, our branches program, the high school interns um, getting to interact with the Indigo Vat and doing, um, I guess we don't have, a, I don't have a photo up here, but they did the um, flower pounding Tataka Zume, I think I'm saying that right. Um, so they got some experience and um, introduction to natural dyes, which is not something that probably they would um, be exposed to otherwise. And it was really exciting for them. And they, you know, they got to take home their little kerchief that they dyed, and it was um, it was a good experience for them. And our whole staff, our whole staff came out, and we, um, I think we also invited select community peoples and our board members to come and interact with that. And then you can see um, the uh, the younger children. We do a super, uh, our Super Kids Camp program, which is rising first through fifth graders. And they got to rotate through all of them and um, put citric acid or lemons onto pre-dyed um, squares of cloth that Kenya dyed and see how the um, the color discharged and make patterns out of that as well. Um, and we did have high hopes for this. Um, you know, this was our pilot season. We were really trying to um, figure out our community engagement piece. And there is a lot of work done on the off season and um, preparation for this season to um, figure out what that looked like for the wider community. Um, we do have the Druid Hill Farmers Market right across Ocantrali Terrace from us. And so, um, yeah, big idea this year was to um, display at that, um, at the farmer's market and, um, you know, have lots of demonstrations and a progression throughout the summer. I do think they're opening up again this year. So maybe we have some modified, um, some modified table at the farmer's market, but um, we're trying to figure, we were, instead we're doing, um, uh, Rosa has been doing workshops online and um, doing more, you know, virtual content or digital content for um, showing people how to use natural dyes at home. Um, so this one is uh, one of the harvesting days and processing days we did with the First Lady of Maryland. There's so much indigo to harvest. Um, we had several volunteer days to um, have people come and harvest it. 
because with just two farmers on staff plus Rosa, um, there's just not, you know, there's not enough manpower to do a lot of this labor intensive work. Um, and you can also see some Micah people in this picture. A lot of the partner team, Micah has been a big um, part of this, this project doing a lot of the really important um, legwork on all the, you know, social and cultural implications of natural dye in history and, you know, from now and moving into the future. So they've been a big part of making this program successful. Next photo. Um, so this shows the, the drying process and the storage process. Um, the, there's a lot of harvesting going on, especially with those marigolds. Um, so um, we just had drying racks in the existing carriage house um, for the flower heads. And then um, those papers on the floor of the Silver Center you see in the, the upper left are um, all the indigo seeds that were dried um, and stored. And then um, you can see in the middle on the top right is um, the indigo pigments that were stored in the fridge, processed and then stored in the fridge. So you can imagine the volume of um, plant matter that is consolidated into those tiny little um, quarts of, of indigo sludge. Next slide. Um, and this is, Rosa said I should include how um, this project has personally affected me. Uh, it's been really wonderful to, for me to um, be introduced to natural dyes and my own knitting practice and, you know, dyeing yarn. And um, that's my two year old. And um, I, she's been benefited by getting lots of naturally dyed garments. So um, it's really, you know, it's been a blessing for me to work on this project with all these talented people and be able to glean some of their brilliance um, and, you know, make it make my life better for the um, for being part of it. Um, so thank you. If there's any, you know, you can reach out to me personally if you have any questions about the operation of the project or anything like that. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see. Son, are you ready? Uh, sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Give me one second, please. Totally. Take Sorry time. for the technical issue. <laughs> no, you're good. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Kenya. <laughs> okay, I'm finding. Also, hi, Indigo, if you're watching too. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for being here on this Friday, this very humid Friday here in Baltimore. Um, I guess I just want to start off with, with gratitude for the space. One second, I want to drink some water. Uh, I want to thank Rosa for facilitating this. I want to, yeah, thank y'all for coming out. I want to give gratitude for this team that I work with on this project. They're amazing. Laura, Rosa, Kenya, and the extended network of many people that are that have their hands in this project. Um, yeah, uh, and I guess I also just want to say how empowering this project has been as a uh, just as a grower, as a plant cultivator, learning how to grow at scale, going from indoor gardening to you know, growing and to go on the farm scale and things like that. It's been, it's been really fun. It's been really a, a great learning experience and yeah, super empowering. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm sorry, yeah, let's see. So I'm here to talk about farming and how it relates to art and how that relates to healing and ritual uh, community engagement, which Kenya will even dive way more into, uh, the, just steward how farming is stewardship for the earth and the many uh, facets of that as well. And one of the really big things and how I got into it is just about food security and justice. And yeah, I feel like I, I came into this from a lens of 
where I got into plant cultivation period, even before this project from a lens of uh, art, creativity and justice. Um, let's see here. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to start off with a great quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, the writer of Braiding Sweet Grass. Um, and action on behalf of life transforms uh, because relationship between self and the world, oh wow, this one just did something weird, okay. Between self and the world is reciprocal. It is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. Um, as we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And I feel like that last part is really huge and a big part of how I got into this work uh, early on or herbalism specifically was because of, was for that healing. And it was amazing to me to just see how you know, getting into it to actually heal myself and then seeing like the beauty in my yard, you know, from that cultivation and all of that. Uh, so it's it's such a beautiful reciprocal relationship. Um, all kinds of cultivation. Uh, let's see real quick, one second. The screen's doing something funny on my end. One moment, yeah. Okay, can, um, son? Yeah, you're good. Um, so. You have a fan club, would like to see your face with the full screen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I apologize, I was so into the time frame. So let me, let you me. Do your thing and I will figure out what's going on. on <laughs> so one second, because my notes just went like, bleh, just exploded out of nowhere. Would you like to say <laughs> hi to everyone before I move into the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. It's getting fixed. Here we are. One moment. Do, 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 do. Technical things. Everybody's learning how to do this virtual yeah, show um, right now. Yeah. Great. <laughs> you you want to say um, hi real quick before I move to the next oh, yeah. slide? Hello, everyone. Let's see what's yeah. going on. Who's saying hi? <laughs> <laughs> hi. Hi. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Yeah. Oh, the Popular family. Y'all are great. Blessings. Okay. Blessings. I Much see. It. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. Red shirt, son. And <laughs> nice in shirt. It's a Japanese printmaking image, right? Right. Like a, right. right. Okay. Yeah, um, okay, I'm ready now. I'm good. My notes are, are no longer exploded. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> I will move it to the slash, okay? Right. Yeah. Awesome. And when you're ready, you can actually go to the next slide too. Sure. So take your time. So yeah, I guess going on more about that reciprocal relationship, a huge part of that is just listening to the plants. Um, and that's been a huge part of this project, listening to the indigo. Uh, figuring out its needs and working with the spaces, um, the the modular house, working with you know the temperatures that they like, the humidity that they like, etc. Um, and that could be a, a rabbit hole that I could dive into, but we're not talking about indoor gardening today, so it won't go there. <laughs> um, so I guess my story, just to kind of like synop, make this like really really quick, so I don't take up too much time. But um, going back to how I relate this farming to art and ancestry. Um, I grew up farming, well, gardening with my mom pretty much every summer. Summer vacations were very much in the backyard and then the front yard, beautifying the space with food and ornamental plants and, you know, all, all different kinds, pollinator, pollinator plants. And um, I didn't realize the beauty of the work that we were doing at the time, but it's amazing to be recalling so many things from then. And, and it's, it's wonderful to be collaborating with my family now on projects with farming as well. And and having conversations with my mother and hearing her it's hearing her recall stories about my great grandmother and great great grandmother and their plant work and um and the healing that the family got got from all of them when you know the struggle was even harder so uh, i definitely come come to this work from a place of his, historic interest and place of like healing uh, systemic trauma and and all of those things because these stories are very important to me um and and I guess like fast forwarding, I, I've always been a creative person. I got really interested in performance art and, and, and with that social justice. And that was really important, important to me and still is for, you know, and 
and will be for a long time probably. And that carried over. And first, uh, first off, that performance started as very um, militant and you know almost maybe even violent per se. And it turned into a very healing and public facing and um, a much more healing environment, interacting with the space and the people within it, and kind of like empower, you know, chanting empowering words and the, the ritual involved in that. Um, and I went from that and for, had a fortunate opportunity to move to California for a few years and had the privilege of, uh, of that nature access and um, the privilege of uh, just plants blooming all year long. And that, that's where I really dove into uh, plant, plant care, actually, uh, that environment of plant use, um, even just being within the cannabis industry and how big that is. I actually worked for a few commercial places for a number of years, and that's where a lot of my knowledge comes from. Um, or a lot of my experience comes from. Uh, and with that also, uh, I learned, uh, that's where I also dove into herbalism. That, those were some of my first steps there, working at, uh, learning at Ancestral Apothecary out there, um, East Bay Meditation Center. They had many classes and other other little workshops around. And, and now I'm at like year three or four and it's, it's just been a, a beautiful journey. It's been a beautiful journey. And here I, here I am now find, finding myself back in Baltimore, now I think two or three years in. And, working on this project and and still finding, you know, that it all still relates to that sculpture work, that performance work, that the herbalism work, uh, it's it's all very interconnected, the ancestry work. Um, yeah, uh, you know, working in the garden, listening to those plants and hearing my grandmother's voices. Um, yeah, Let's see, uh, next slide. <laughs> yes, yay, bear. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, and that's a quick side note, uh, the serendipity of this project that Laura was talking about. Uh, Kenya and I both spent a lot of time in Oakland and we literally both decided to come back to Baltimore at the same time. We didn't even know each other, it just happened like that. Uh, so talk about serendipity. Um, so, and here I am now, uh, it's a present, uh, you know, the middle fold uh, photo, let's say folder, <laughs> the middle a uh, photo is a picture of me on some acquired land that my family bought maybe 10, 15 years ago that we finally finally figured out what we want to do with, you know, just steward, steward and create a wonderful farm called uh, Liberation Seed. Um, and it's not just a family farm. I definitely want collaborators. So if anybody wants to ask me about that, please do later um, or hit me up on Instagram, anything like that. Um, the photo to the right is some very early on collected calendula, very early in my herbalism and the left is skull cap harvested very early on in my herbalism career. So yeah, presently I'm, you know, busy with the Baltimore Dye Initiative, busy on the farm in Virginia, and also busy with mushroom cultivation and many other things. Um, but I'll get into that in a moment. Um, next slide, please. So, um, you know, on this slide, I really want to ask the question of, you know, can creation be categorized? You know, asking this question of how does farming relate to art and I guess when I boil it down to the basics for me, that's just, it's all about creation. It's all about um, cultivation. I don't think, I think painting on a canvas is cultivation as well. You know, um, you're growing an idea on that canvas just as much as we're growing plants out of the ground. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So I don't, I don't, to me, farming isn't separated from it at all. We're, we're doing it for a, Art is usually made for personal growth. It's usually made for as a message for collective growth, and people usually farm for collective growth, individual growth, for that satiation, for that healing. Um, uh, and that's yeah, that's where I feel these are very connected. Um, yeah, I think about how the plant life cycle and how it relates to our growth as humans, as you know, the eventual blooming uh, from the spiritual sense, even of knowledge and wisdom. Um, so. I I think one of the, the beauties of cultivation is just finding ourselves connected to those things or those woo-woo things. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I kind of see every plant that I put in the ground or every, every single action, you know, watering the plants, all of that as that that's another ritual or rite, you know, a, rite of, a different rite of passage, you know. Um, and I, so I treat them with care and respect. Um, yeah. Um, uh, next slide. <laughs> I think that's all I would say about that for a moment. Um, and if you want, you could just maybe just play that video. Can I play it now? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Sure. I don't think it has sound. <laughs> um, so yeah, kind of 
reiterating what I said, you know, all this sacred and stewardship, um, these are all rituals, the plants being harvested, uh, the plants being watered. Uh, uh, oh yeah, and you know, a, a huge part of this project and you know, I love the people we, another reason why I love the people that we work with is just connecting these plants to history and um, their, their timeline, their pathway from one continent to another and how that relates to, you know, slave trade and, you know, both beautiful things and problematic things, you know, all there's just so many different facets of plants and their history and yeah, and, and it shouldn't be ignored. And I feel like that's part of the healing of all these, all these systems of oppression and this like trauma that we carry from many generations back, you know, uh, to, to be thinking about all these things as we're doing this planting and this cultivation and this dye work and you know, um, just thinking about where these symbols come from and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Next slide. <laughs> okay. You get it. Get it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, this photo was actually uh, a very, actually my first tinctures in California like years ago. Uh, and in this, this one, I'm kind of asking, oh, I can't even see. Okay. So, yeah, stewardship is a process of healing. Um, and, oh, one second. My notes are blowing up again. Here we go. Yeah, I feel like creative expression and healing have always been sewn together. Um, the creation or the search for beauty is, is a resistance, a struggle. You know, it, it's not even about making the perfect tincture or the perfect, uh, having the perfect garden, but just if you cultivate that one extremely beautiful plant that will bring so much healing to your life. Um, it doesn't take having a, an extremely, you know, huge space and a huge garden to, to feel that the beauty of stewardship. Um, there's, yeah, doesn't take a lot. And I feel like, yeah, that's been the beauty of this project. Again, talking about the learning how to do things at scale and experiencing things at scale. Um, yeah, just, just just the different flavors of it all. Yeah, um, next slide. Um, so yeah, another huge part of, you know, farming as art, farming as healing, and a part of that I feel like is just the empowerment of education, um, and specifically educating, you know, our local communities, the people that are close to us. Um, I think that's, I think that's like the huge, a huge part of where this project is now is, you know, I feel like Kenya almost every time, pretty much every time we're together, we're talking about, uh, how can we empower the community more with this, this project? And Laura talked about how we're trying to do work with the Druid Hill Farmers Market to be more front facing with the community, to let them know why we're there and the work we're doing and let them know the history of these spaces that we're using and the plants that, and the plants that we're using as well. Um, so education is a, is a, it's a huge part. Um, yeah. And, you know, going back to that justice aspect, education is, as justice, um, going back to that empowerment, uh, families, you know, knowing that, uh, they can dye certain things. They can dye their baby clothing, you know, um, and create those special things for for little model for little money uh, or with their food waste and things like that. You know, they don't have to go to the babies R us, you know, per se or things like that. You know, it's it's very empowering, and just just the you know the beauty that comes from that or you know the creation of that heirloom. Um, talk about like generational healing. You know, uh, it kind of reminds me of. It makes me think of. Um, Oh yeah, that's, this is Dove Coat. Um, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of um, the quilts that my great grandmother would make my brother and I, and how I still cherish those, and how those little heirlooms that were died, however they were then, you know, and you know they they still bring so much healing now, you know. So talk about yeah, uh, healing those generational wounds through uh, doing these natural processes and the creation of objects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next slide. <laughs> um, so let's see. So yeah, here's just some you know ideas about how cultivation is justice, how it is uh, food security. Um, and then this this background photo is actually you know one of my favorite things when it comes to food securities right now that I'm discovering is just mushroom cultivation. Um, you know the the one on the right, the photo on the right is actually a mushroom block made from a toilet paper roll. Um, so just getting back to cultivation and yeah, just 
the many things that we can, uh, the many systems that we can use to actually sustain ourselves and empower ourselves and our families as well. Um, so yeah, liberation from oppression, you know, uh, cultivation of these plants and these, these medicines, uh, they get us away from these oppressive systems like the healthcare system, the expenses of it. Um, and also just the, uh, even the fear of it. I feel like it's been so wonderful to learn about herbalism and plant work just so when things happen or sickness happens, I automatically feel like I know some quick remedy that I can run to, to at least start the process, you know, before I ever even think about like, oh, emergency room or anything like that. Like, let me try this echinacea first or, you know, whatever that case may be, um, whatever plant I need to use. Uh, grocery store dependence. I feel like it's been a wonderful thing to step away from the grocery store. Uh, and, and let's talk about, you know, food deserts and having access to that food as well. Um, and then, you know, nine to five culture. You know, I feel like one of the beautiful things about cultivating the plants in California and moving here to Baltimore has just been the realis realization of, uh, you know, maybe I don't need to sustain myself with so much money and work so hard to make so much money if I'm already growing X amount of food and, X, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, so it, it also, so that empowerment to step away from that, that grind um, to slow down um, for that healing again. Uh, let's talk about that fast-paced culture. Uh, the liberation from hate. Uh, plants aren't biased. Uh, the they teach us to to love ourselves as well as the world around us, um, and that, that's that's really huge. Um, they they beg for vulnerability. Uh, I feel like garden spaces they often are occupied by people that are searching for 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 connection and love and and vulnerability. So yeah, just plant cultivation is like a way to create safe spaces um, and liberation from harm and trauma. You know, the lessons that plants teach us lead us to a greater care to ourselves and the people around us. They teach us a divine patience and empower us to be vulnerable and strong for our growth and community. I wrote that last night and I felt really good about it. Um, <laughs> just saying, I don't even know how to go say more about that, but yeah, <laughs> oh, next slide. <laughs> Um, so, um, let me make sure I'm hitting all the things before I close up. Do, 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 do. Another your do, gorgeous do. photos, by the way. I don't know, this is, this is, you know, I'll give the credit to Yumi, photographer for this one. Yeah, he did this, he did this. <laughs> um, let's see here. So, yeah, um, I guess the note that I want to leave with is, through all this plant cultivation, through the dye work, through the herbalism, through the mushroom cultivation, through all the many things that we can cultivate and the collaboration that can happen. What we're doing is we're just building res resilience for the future together. And I feel like that's that's the that's what we're carrying carrying with this project, like many of the partners, many of the many of the people that we work with. Um, so um, thank you for this space. Thank you for this time. I hope I've connected farming to art and ritual and ancestry and social justice and and uh, resilience and trauma healing <laughs> for all of you here. And um, yeah, I guess I'll close on that note. Thanks for coming out, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Love. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Stan. We're uh, by the way, we're going to have a Q and A session later after uh, Kenya's presentation. So I see it, Son. You have a whole fan club is here right now. So. <laughs> um, I'll look into that. Cool. Feel free to ask Let's anything. Though. Okay. Um, give me one second, please, because we have only four spots that I have to close Axidolara out for now. And then I'm going to invite Kenya to join with us. Hello, Kenya. Hi, Rosa. Can you hear me? Um, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Here you go. Wow. Indigo oh, wants to say hello to everyone. Hello? Where Hi, Indigo. Miss Rosa, you can't see her right now, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to present something. Can you um, continue to do what you're doing? Okay. Thank Bye. you, love. Um, Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm not sure how well I'm 
scene right now. But um, my name is Kenya Miles. I am one of the farmers um, in the Natural Dye Initiative. Still looks really weird. Okay. Um, thank you, Rosa, for giving me a reason to wear a red lip. Um, it's been a <laughs> while, and I just thought, oh, forty, I'm gonna wear a red lip all the time. Um, and then Corona happened, and you can't really mask with a red lip. I just want to say that. Um, and also um, because Rosa is always so conscious of what um, what our natural dye selves are doing, this top is a cochineal dyed uh, top, which is a parasite that lives on the uh, prickly pear, the nopal cactus, um, and is used to um, produce really beautiful reds and pinks and some purples. Um, and I dyed it, it's a knit, and sewed it in pieces and then re, um, we uh, formed it. Yes, honey. Um, yes. Okay, I need you to go. Thank you. Okay, I'll see you in a second. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so I am really grateful for um, this project as well. Just as Sun Sun so eloquently put it, um, we've had the the good fortune to do what we love every day for the last. Um, 15 months. So that feels like a really big blessing. And <clears throat> on top of that, to be new to a city, um, because originally I'm from DC, PG County. Um, but then to come to Baltimore from Oakland after being there for 11 years and to land on a project that is state funded nonetheless around um, natural dyes is pretty um, unbelievable. So I definitely felt like the things that I um, was doing in life were all meant to lead to this uh, moment. So I feel really blessed in that space. And um, yeah, I, I'm excited to share with you all some of the work that um, Rosa, Sun and I, and Laura, we've all just sort of been folded into this project together, so. Hey, Kenya, can I now share the screen? Yes. I mean, this presentation. All right, I will Let's toggle your it. video for now. Okay. <clears throat> also, I don't have a really beautiful picture of myself in the indigo, so I just want to say <laughs> it was very intimidating um, to follow up Sun's presentation. <laughs> um, but this is what I this is what I have throwing my kid in it for extra cuteness. <laughs> um, I gotta get the the cute points. All right, are we good? Do I need to start? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, it's a little off. Maybe it's off to the left because of the um, chat box. But so oh, I I'm sort of connecting farming as future, but really I'm thinking about it present. Um, farming is future, sustainability, community, um, and craft. And this is an image of my son Indigo, um, who is named after the dye plant, um, and I working with Rosa in the background at Hidden Harvest um, Farm and Garden. And one of the things that has come out of doing um, this project is the desire to sort of continue and so having lived in that you are accustomed to engaging in the world. And I think that's what California gave me the most was this very clear directive that like everything around us is us. And so um, I think moving back East was a little bit of a shock to my system, you know, like, like collecting food scraps and then just like being like, where do these go? I don't know what to do with them, you know? Um, and so just thinking about if there's a world that I want to live in, that I must build it. And so that's sort of the extension of this project. And so I was fortunate enough to get asked to participate as an artist in residence um, in the Baltimore Natural Dye Initiative um, through Valeska, um, who is a professor at MICA and also who facilitated the uh, Natural Dyes Intercultural Connector um, semester class. It was three semesters um, through the Maryland Institute College of Art. So this project that um, I'm working on currently sort of comes from all of these very 
um, intense, um, beautiful, long, thoughtful relationships, ideas, histories around dyes and natural dyes and communities and um, indigenous knowledge and enslaved uh, relationships and enslaved um, sort of histories and knowledge around work um, from Southeast Asia to um, you know, Central Asia to West Africa um, to um, North America and Mexico and other places. So um, we can go to the next slide. So Blue Light Junction is a newly opened um, dye studio. It's an alternative color lab, um, a dye farm co-op, an educational dye garden and facility. We're focusing on processing, growing, and preserving the history of natural dyes and their enhancements and use in everyday objects. Um, so the main mission, um, as Sun talked about, really the community engagement, um, community connectivity, um, but also just around um, the viability of growing and living in the world that we want to see, you know, not just down at the harbor or in specific places where people are privileged to think about the earth, right? Like it is all our um, right to think about the things that we are feeding ourselves and what we are feeding into the world um, and the future of, of our children and the children around us. So, um, we were fortunate enough during this project to son and I were farming at um, with Rosa supervising at uh, parks and people, but then also to be able to take a garden that um, is nearby my home um, hidden harvest. They had an annexed um, lot that had not um, been used that season. And so um, the MICA team, I and Rosa all kind of came together to think about growing on this land and uh, can't hear me. Hmm. Let's see. I I'm okay with that, but oh, you can't hear me. Can you hear me, Rosa? Yeah. I can't hear you. Okay. Okay. I think. Uh, um. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. So maybe ask um if anybody outside can hear, because I know Lars outside now. Um. So looking at this project and thinking about um, a lot of plants that have been native, have been native to um, the region, the, the bio region, things like that. Um, and also really looking to, I was trying early on to connect to um, the American Indian community, the indigenous community here and thinking about um, their um, heritage and practices um, and so th that has been something to be sort of um, continued um, and it's going to be an ongoing process. But we were essentially taking the plants that we dyed uh, or that we were growing at Parks and People, um, indigo and marigolds, and we grew them at Hidden Harvest last season and also added a number of plants. We had brown cotton. We had um, uh, hollyhock. We had... Um, yellow dock, um, yarrow, we, we just kind of like went a little wild. Um, and we're like, great, let's grow that. Great. Let's grow that. I think that what I've learned from that experience is just that, um, taking the time to really, um, spend time with each plant and sort of looking at its habits, um, allows for greater, um, respect and knowledge and, um, connectivity. And so, um, you know, I would say like the Holy grail for, for me, for sure is, um, braiding sweet grass. Um, I listen to it often, um, cause I, I just like hearing her voice. So that has really allowed me to really connect things, um, in a really, um, giving way um, and not what I can take. Uh, next slide. So sort of looking at blue light junction phases or in three um, compartments, the alternative color lab, um, this was the final um, during one of the, the fall semester for the MICA students um, at the, as a part of the natural dyes intercultural intercultural connector class. And um, what we really did was think about um, 
production and like seeing products like we made some candles with indigo and cochineal um what would packaging look like if there were kits um what would it look like if there was a csa what would it look like if there was a farm co-op um and so i'm a big per person on sort of like spaces and um would love to have been an interior designer if i was a person who wanted to listen to the clients but i actually really don't just want to do what i want to do so that doesn't work so what was nice about creating these spaces um, and this space in particular is that we just thought about like um, a kind of a bodega vibe. Like what would it be like inside of, okay, honey, just leave it. Um, what would it be like um, thinking about this as a store and a shop and a place and be engaged in this as a practice, but trying to make it easy and accessible um, and really universal and not about class or um, these sort of you know barriers that we are consistently putting in front of ourselves or people have put in front of us. Um, so that's really what the Alternative Color Lab was experimenting with um, through the MICA pro process. And really a lot of it is thinking about local collaboration, um, consulting other businesses that are interested in taking their product or um, a certain level of their production into um, more sustainable practices through the use of plants and other natural dyes and experimenting with um, that kind of product development um, through access um, to samples that we are growing of things in the, um, in the garden at Hidden Harvest. Next slide. Um, another aspect is really thinking about craft and community. I had the great fortune um, to teach a workshop of about 20 women who are all part of the African-American quilters of Baltimore. Um, and, you know, if I could have requested um, 20, you know, elder grandmothers, like they would all be a part of it. They all have such unique, um, amazing personalities, but also are like so talented and so eager to learn more. So when the opportunity through um, Micah came up to have this relationship, because they have a relationship with Micah um, where they do a, um, uh, a quilt every uh, year to be auctioned off, um, I was so... Um, yeah, I mean, I was I was really like taken aback that they were so enthusiastic and excited. And during the class, um, I do workshops. I've basically done workshops for the last nine years or so that are six hours and really teach about a certain kind of um, dying um, pr practice that I do, which is really hand painting and printing. I'm really into very graphic imagery. So less whole cloth dyeing, but more just like... Um, silk screening and hand painting and um, stamps and things like that. So the connecting to the community was a huge part of it through workshops and dye demonstrations um, and really allowing the practitioners to share their knowledge and for that to help evolve the process. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Rosa, next. Um, these are just some examples from classes um, or um, some of the production that's happened. The left are um, fresh leaves from the um, land at Parks and People, the flowers that will then, um, they were a little early to be picked, um, but they're really beautiful, but they eventually go to seed. We made a uh, paint out of them. So you can make paint from indigo um, using different kinds of binders. The middle is an example of a variety of, um, there's an indigo powder in the center, the top left, that kind of green, um, is from the Black Eyed Susans that we grew. The right is marigolds and kind of back in the bottom, we have some um, some pokeberry and other things um, that we were experimenting with and some indigo. Um, I also use soy as a binder when I paint. Um, my son and I have done a lot of painting with soy and um, um, material and, and um, pigment together. The top um, is a process that I teach, which is through, um, this was at Pyramid Atlantic in um, Hyattsville, where I teach people how to create a, a paste to do um, printing through silk screening. Um, and that then goes into a dye vat. Um, yeah, next. And then the third aspect of Blue Light Junction um, is back to the sort of richness of, of gardening and how that can really um, 
connect all aspects of the project. Rosa um, has been an amazing co-farmer uh, with me in the um, Hidden Harvest Annex. And so she sort of visioned this, we were writing a grant um, to have access to a few more amenities um, because it was just an empty lot. So we're looking to get fencing and some um, raised beds that we can have as community uh, use for growing herbs and flowers. And, you know, I get myself fresh flowers every week. And so that is such a um, immense boost. I've been doing it for like 20 years. So um, for me, emotionally, it just does so much. So um, I wanted to be able to give that to people. So Rosa created this illustration on the right, um, visioning for the garden. We have this beautiful trail kind of going through the middle, um, shadowy. And, um, and on the left is really actually us building, you know, not even really thinking about it, but then realizing that like what your intentions are, are 100% um, you know, how you follow through with things. So we're literally making the garden that Rosa drew, but not even, ten, you know, thinking about, about it consciously, I guess. So I say the annex lot um, at Hidden Harvest hosted the first season of the Baltimore Natural Dye Initiative. The second season, the garden is looking to explore more closed loop system um, through resource maximizing with rainwater catchment, composting, community run herb and dye beds um, as well. Um, we've also started with the support of MICA, um, a, a natural dye co-op, a collective of three farms in Baltimore City that are also um, growing indigo and marigolds. And so we're gonna collect our um, work and harvest the indigo twice and then go through um, production together and see what it looks like to be um, to able to support a small um, production of um, small batch dyes um, or other things that we can do um, through Baltimore um, and all of the urban farms that are so amazing here. So um, that's another initiative that uh, I'm really, really excited about. And I have to just say, like, I live three blocks from the garden and like, it's so, I like, I just want to run over every day. It, like, looks so good. Valeska has been bringing wood chips and we're like in there making paths and it's, it's really stunning. So, uh, next, Rosa is an amazing artist. Kim, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the way, these um, Kenya, uh -huh. I, I'm yeah. I'm so sorry I didn't mean to cut you up, but um we don't we still need to secure five minutes for the okay. Q and A session. Okay. So I'm yeah, gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up. It. So this sure. is Thank these you. are the things that we're cultivating native species. We have um, also some um, fibers. We've been growing um, different kinds of uh, cotton. Um, and the matter root, this is the top left is our matter root year one. So we'll go through creating three, um, three seasons of matter root. And then third season, we'll be able to harvest the first season. So it needs three to five years to really start to produce rich reds. Next slide. I'm running through it. Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, we are just starting. There's so much to be done. And so if you're interested in supporting in any way, bluelightjunction at gmail com is a great way to get in touch with me. Um, we have a GoFundMe. There are volunteer days at um, Hidden Harvest. Thursdays, um, we're there five to seven. Saturdays, noon, generally until three. Sometimes, you know, um, especially if my son's not with me, I'll stay much longer. Um, so if any of those things are interested, interesting to you, please let us know. Please contact um, Rosa, myself, son. Um, we would love your support. And and just your energy. It's a really wonderful way, especially now. Um, and on the right, that's Rosa planting um, some cotton. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, now, okay, I just really wanted to show this photo because it's amazing. So now we're at the Q&A session. I'm Thank gonna you. bring everyone back, okay. Um, I need to find the Laura bag.
Can you hear me, son? Mm -hmm. I see you got yeah. all those bottles in the back. I'm trying to get down with oh, the yeah. with the preservation station. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm still looking for Alara. Vancouver. Okay, we're gonna. I think Alara has some connection issue right now. Vancouver. So, um, yeah. if you guys have any questions, okay, I'm gonna do this to stop yelling. Or Kenya, let me see. We have two questions. I love you, Mama. I love you too. How can I get connected to the garden works as a volunteer and more? Yeah, we have volunteer um, a volunteer coordinator through Parks and People um, through the NDIC. Her name is Claire. So um, I'm not sure how we can maybe give some information at the end, but um, Parks and People definitely has volunteer um, opportunities for the remainder of the seasons that we're working on the um, project. I um, also feel like it's a great post, um, it's a great COVID activity because you really don't have to be in an enclosed space and you can, you know, work on a row. Um, so that's been great. And then through Hidden Harvest, um, myself or Rosa, um, are working directly on that. So, um, yeah, oh, no. uh, my first and last name at Gmail, or you can at Gmail. Oh yeah, there's Claire. Um, yeah, I guess so, I can also. Yeah, so we have another very important question from, let me see. So, from, um, it's a from Lawrence. Lauren. Yes. I feel I feel a lot of generational trauma being Native American and many of my family's tradition recipe, recipe, um, agriculture uh, practice were either lost or destroyed through colonialism. When I try to do research, many of the historical accounts I find are written by white women who stayed with uh, Ojibwe people. Do you know of any books, resources about Native American agriculture that comes from the source? Yeah, I personally was really um, focusing my energy the first season, the first semester on looking through um, and, and native and indigenous practices um, local to the region and found the same sort of challenges. And, and I, um, I don't have any, like I went down to the, and started to try to build a relationship with the um, Baltimore, um, I forget what the, it's like, Baltimore American Indian, like what the exact um, acronym yeah, is. Yeah, it's in the first point, yeah. Yeah, um, which was really helpful. And I think um, I, I just realized a lot of what I had learned. I lived, I didn't sort of talk about my backstory, but I lived in Mexico um, 15, six, 17 years ago or something. Um, and I just really found that through my travels in Central America, <laughs> and other places that it was really only through sitting with people and spending time with those communities or um, being on the ground that I that I was ever gonna get anything that was a direct from the source. Yeah, I, I would piggyback pretty much everything you said. And uh, one thing that just popped up in my mind and just in that last few moments is, you know, talking about being on the ground, one of the beautiful things you have access to are places like Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York and people like that who are familiar with a lot of those practices and are, you know, teaching them pretty actively with their residencies and things like that. So I'd say even like search for residencies because there's a lot of farming residencies popping up with people who are taught in those aspects. And there's quite a few and I'm even discovering the Northeast through some like classes that I'm working through with some of the networks. I'm, uh, getting involved in. So check on some like local farms in the Northeast and like upstate New York and places like that. Uh, there's a lot of little gems of people doing some of that work. That's just my two cents on it. <laughs> so we have a, a huge resource list that I created and I'm gonna copy and paste on the um, chat box so that uh, we can share it. And I'll also say I've had like, you know, talk about the search for ancestry and all that. Uh, my great, great grandmother was Akahanak, Akahanak and uh, they're from the, uh, the Susquehanna kind of Chesapeake Bay region here in Maryland. And 
the best resources I found for kind of finding that ancestry and those resources is, is just going, there's, there's a church here in Baltimore that actually has access to all the ancestry things for free, all the big databases for like records and all those things for free. So just look it up on online for like ancestry uh, documentation at, at like your local library or something like that. Cause they're in every state, every city, there's a place that's like, that's a resource for all those things. Can't remember the exact name of the one here in Baltimore, but they exist for all those to get access to all those records and online things all for free. So yeah, to form those relationships. And I'm sure they also know some people will be connected to. Yeah, I wanted to just say one other thing that um, when I, I remember many years ago, um, during the, um, and I'm not sure if it was exactly when it happened, but um, when the National Endowment for the Arts and a lot of things were built, they were doing a lot of stuff during um, like New Deal kind of things where people were literally making videos for, um, different practices. And I remember coming across these really old documentaries of like, um, I think it was in Arizona, but um, indigenous, um, an indigenous family making um, lacrosse sticks and like the, the traditional practice around that. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's, like I really want to get um, a grant to figure out. Like I just want to, you know, roam the earth and find all of these little gems. But I feel like that kind of stuff um, is really a life's work. And so there are people who are focusing their energy, and you kind of just have to like grind a little bit and find those people and find that work, and then connect the dots little by little um, and try your best to stay. Um, positive and resilient in the search, you know, because it can be really disheartening to feel like um, those things are um, missing or lost. Um, but yeah, somewhere someone has something um, and with enough persistence and um, energy, I think that those things can be re reconnected and regenerated. Okay, Laura is now joining with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That is a really great resource list. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to copy and paste that myself. <laughs> I know, I want all these to know. <laughs> yeah, I also wanted to um, remind uh, us that there is a an artist, Weaver, um, Rico Newman, who um, is uh, connected we were having a symposium also as a part of the um, NDIC and um, his son is a farmer in Virginia and um, she kind of talks about it in the chat a little bit. So that might also help Lauren um, just to have some local connection, right. um, even if it's not the, the the exact same like tribe. Yeah. And also um, Chris Newman has been um, like practicing um, their traditional finger weaving. Um, and he does a lot of workshop and really um, actively like um, sharing um, his um, the knowledge is from his ancestors that I would love to share the link or uh, his information later for Lauren. Okay, um, actually we are now passing almost 10 minutes. So I think we have to close the session. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Laura, that you had some connection yeah. issue. Yeah. <laughs> My you guys want to say like a loss or like something? Okay. Just thanks to everyone involved in this. Yeah. Yeah. That's thank cool. you all for coming and listening and um, feeling enthusiastic about what we are doing. And um, yeah, I'm wishing wellness for everyone. And, you know, it's going to take a lot of healing. And I think that plants um, and plant medicine and plant healing are like, the way forward, you know, the way of the past and the way forward, truly. Okay. <laughs> what about you, Laura? Do you have something to share, yeah. say before closing? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just grateful for everyone's interest in my own, uh, this project opening up my own eyes and interest to all this magical stuff. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work that are not part of this um, session. So, Many thanks to them. Oh, well, okay.
thank you yeah. very much for everyone who participated today. And I really feel so grateful that we had this opportunity given. So I really appreciate you all and have a rest of, enjoy your rest of your Friday. Okay. Thank um, you, Rosa, for putting this all together. Hope to see you all at the farm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Bye. See you at the garden. Take Bye. Care. Bye. <laughs>